Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. I think most of you already know the team. We have Frederick sitting in Hong Kong and helping me out here, guiding us uh, later on through the question and answer session. And I have Roland here in the back uh, doing all the video recording, sound uh, adjustment, and so on. So thank you very much to you guys uh, for your help. And uh, yeah, Frederick as well is, of course, taking care of the Asia Pacific region and also invite a lot of you guys uh, from this area to join the webinar and very happy that uh, yeah such a big number of people is uh, going to join from that region and we have Europe of course as well good morning to everybody from here it's an earlier start one hour earlier than uh, usual uh, that was a special request of our Dutch colleagues so uh, and we do everything which is possible Okay, I would say uh, let's get started. Uh, today is a very special session uh, because we, yeah, it's only once in a while that we really have something extremely new, completely new, uh, something, yeah, let's say where there's no limitation for the engineering team where we just say, okay, let's go, show us uh, your cap capabilities and uh, bring us the new reference series a new state of the art product and uh, this time it's in the AV segment it's uh, yeah it's not an AV receiver as you know it's the AV10 and the M10 our new reference flagships and this presentation today will be very little about marketing it will be very little about features but overall it will be uh, about technique. So don't get uh, disappointed if I don't give you a big sales story right in the hand, but it's more about uh, that I would like to show you about the capabilities we have in Marantz and what makes these two products, the AV10 and M10, that special and what kind of engineering knowledge went into it to make it a real reference product. But just to quickly summarize uh, uh, again here, a brief uh, overview about our lineup. You know, we have uh, lately started with the Cinema Series. Uh, that's actually uh, going from bottom to top. We have the Cinema Slim Series, that's the Cinema 70S, a new dimension in home cinema, everything you need for an AV system, but from a small uh, cabinet. Then we have the Cinema Series with the 60, the 50, the 40. Uh, the 40 is going to come uh, beginning of next year, but we also will have a separate session on to introduce you to the Cinema 40. Uh, these are the AV receivers or AV amplifiers. And then we have the AV series, and that's what we're talking about today, uh, the AV separates. And all, of course, follow our sound philosophy, the pursuit of purity when it comes to, uh, to the audio performance. And uh, that's what you're going to listen to. So AV10, M10, uh, you have seen the picture, I'm pretty sure, because we are using it several times now. And uh, they just look very nice and neat. So the cinemas uh, or Cinefire's dreams and custom integrator choice. That's actually uh, what we put on uh, the task list for the engineering. Give us everything you can give us. Uh, don't mind the cost. We just want to have the best of the best and we want to have it um, in any place. So be it at customer's home as uh, yeah, by, by the standard user while standard is most likely not the right customer for AV10, M10, but also for CI integrators. We wanted to have the most musical sound into AV. So that's our sound philosophy, which we taking actually from the hi-fi into uh, the AV segment. We want to have the next generation flagship, really having the best performance and the, the latest technologies, the nicest feature set into this uh, uh, combination. And it ended up with having in total 16 channel of amplification and 15.4 channel of uh, processing power. AV separates is nothing new for us. We already started in 2008, bringing out the first AV uh, preamplifier, the AV8003 at that time. Yeah, uh, imagine there was no Dolby Atmos or whatsoever. Uh, it was just Dolby and DTS uh, standard uh, 7.1. Um, but this unit already had AV network video streaming built in. So that was quite unique at that time. Of course, we all know it. Uh, this feature doesn't exist anymore. 
because there are so many uh, different solutions on the field on the market uh, so it doesn't really make sense to integrate in the AV. When, then we had uh, several other solutions uh, AV8801 which the HDM boards also lined up uh, like you see on the center separation picture underneath. 8802 that was the time where we started to have uh, Dolby Atmos and then of course uh, 8805 you had Dolby Atmos, DTSX, Oro 3D. So it already always built up in, in, in the number of uh, yeah, channels and um, the, the formats supported. So today we are going to uh, look into the AV10 with a 15.4 channel processing and all the nice feature set. Here, a quick overview about the lineup because it's very important to understand the AV80805 A will continue in the lineup. Yeah, so it's not going to be replaced by the AV10, which actually means we have uh, three AV separates: 7, uh, 7706, 8805, AV10. So it's a really nice lineup, and you can fit it out with uh, all the power amplifiers you see on the right-hand side, from a stereo five-channel, seven-channel, up to the new 16-channel amplifier. But let's jump into the um, uh, AV10. Maybe Roland, just a quick uh, change of the camera, please, so I can show you the unit we have here on display. So you see it's pretty nice in combination with the amplifier. And I also have the nice remote handset over here. And as you can see, it, uh, it has a nice uh, metallic uh, uh, aluminum top surface. So it's nicely shiny. It has a backlit button uh, as well on this one. And it's really nice and heavy in our hands here. So um, can you go back, Roland, please, to the other camera so I can see the presentation again? Okay, here we go. Um, so as already said, we want to transfer the hyper knowledge into the AV segment. We want to have a new reference standard. Uh, key for us was uh, also to manage uh, the noise because, you know, uh, an AV um, component is very crowded inside. A lot of noise is going on. So uh, going on, so we have to get rid of the noise or we have to control the noise in a way that it doesn't interfere with the audio signal. So high frequency noise management was one of the key aspects and you will see later on in, uh, in our measurements result how we have done that uh, or what we have achieved. And by that we built it up the state of the art AV solution. Just a look uh, to, the, to the rear panel and uh, yeah, it's installers happen uh, because you actually will find all kind of connections uh, required. You have in total 17 output channels because you can do different configuration um, that you actually can install 17 speakers and the AV automatically switches be between the, the 15 channels it wants to run or to drive. So it's very convenient. You have phone, you have a, a dedicated CD input with higher quality RCA terminals or XLR terminals. Uh, as input. You have the networking, you have the HDMI with a, uh, all 8K capable, you have trigger control stuff, uh, so all you need to, to get from, a, a, you, you need to have for a third party control uh, solution. The HDMI outputs do support 300 milliampere on current, which is needed to drive uh, active HDMI cables, so this is all um, covered as well. And we also have four independent subwoofer outputs which really, uh, yeah, you already have listened to the, the former presentation, I guess, uh, where I explained all the uh, uh, capabilities or possibilities we have with the four subwoofer outputs. So that's pretty nice. Looking into specification, 15.4 um, channel processing, that of course uh, requires a high quality and very fast uh, DSP digital signal processor. We are utilizing here the Griffin Light XP as well. And uh, you can see all the formats. In addition, of course, we also have uh, um, the uh, Odyssey Mighty EQ32 uh, automatic room calibration, but also we are going to support direct live on this unit here. HDMI already mentioned, all 8K, all the latest features on the HDMI. And we have the HEOS network uh, built in, which uh, gives you yeah, access to all the music streaming services, but also external control uh, from um, uh, via IP address to uh, via third-party control systems. Let's have a quick look to uh, the DSP, the Griffin Light DSP, as mentioned, is really powerful, 2000 MIPS um, 
per, per second. So that's really a lot of calculation power. And that's also needed, as said, for supporting all the audio formats and the four subwoofers and the Dirac Live and the Odyssey Mighty EQ XT32. So it's all covered, it's all handled well by this very powerful DSP. If it comes out of the DSP, you get a digital signal. And of course, this digital signal needs to get converted into an analog. Yeah, so because in the end, we want to uh, amplify it and to drive our speakers with it. Um, this, what you see over here, is our DA uh, conversion board. And it holds 10 times a stereo ESS 9018 DAC. So this gives us really high um, um, yeah, conversion power, actually to say, uh, to get the analog uh, audio signal on the highest level. And to guarantee, I, I spoke about getting noise under control and to, to have the, the most cleanest uh, um, background, no noise, no interference by uh, unwanted high frequencies, we are utilizing a four layer uh, PCB. So the board actually where all the uh, DA converters are uh, installed on, mounted on, is made of four layers. I'm coming back to that one uh, in, a, um, in a minute. But keep it in mind, it's a four-layer PCB. By this, uh, uh, we minimize crosstalk. And in addition to that, we also allocate the, the channels per DA converter. So for example, a one DA converter is not doing the left and right channel, because actually on these channels, there's a lot of going on in the same time. But we, for example, combine the right channel with the surround rear right channel because then we know there's very little correlation and uh, the surround rear right channel will have very little influence to the uh, uh, right channel on the front, which is more sensitive. So we can minimize crosstalk. By that, we actually can really nicely increase performance as well. All the DA converters, of course, uh, need to work in sync. So timing is key. Everything should be perfectly timed, no jitter and so on, um, because that will also diminish the quality of the audio signal, the only local audio signal you will get. So we have a high quality crystal dock, uh, which is not the big black one you can see on the top uh, right, but actually it's a little uh, silver one, which is right beside it. And uh, the left uh, beside it, the black one, is actually uh, the, the, yeah, let's say the buffer the, the for the uh, signal and uh, distributing the uh, clock signal through the whole uh, DA converter board. Low jitter, low noise, perfect conversion from digital to analog. So very important to pay a lot of attention here as well. And as you can see on the board, it's all fully symmetrical. Okay, then uh, of course, uh, after you have your analog signal from the digital board, you need to get uh, yeah, to the volume control uh, IC. And then, of course, you have to drive your uh, connectors, your pre-outs, be it RCA, the change one, or the XLR. And to get this done in a proper way, we are utilizing our HDM technology, you know, hyperdynamic amplifier module, our little amplifier module, which we can tweak to the needs we want to have it. We can, uh, it's made by discrete components. Um, we can, uh, yeah, optimize it for the circuitry all the time. And that's also what we have done here again. And that, in the end, gives us very fast signal handling. So the slew rate is very high. Yeah, so the signal goes up very quickly if an impulse happens. And not like uh, you can see on the right-hand side on an op amp where it's very slow and it can't actually follow the high frequency signal that nicely. In addition, the HDM is very uh, low on the noise level. So again, noise is key, but we want to get under control. In the end, it will give us a, a very high uh, resolution sound with a lot of details and precision and focus. Um, I'm taking here a comparison on the next slides, always to the AV8805, uh, because if you just look from the outer outside, just checking this feature list, you say, okay, it might be the same like uh, we have done on the 8805, but just added two channels. Absolutely not the case. It's a completely uh, own development, the AV10. And uh, this, for example, here is the HDM board uh, on the right-hand side from the 8805. On the left-hand side, the new one, slightly bigger. Uh, 
uh, different type of components, different layout. So it's completely new design port. And here again, also let me uh, point out, it's also a four layer PCB. Yeah? So uh, very nicely done. And of this PCB, we have uh, about 19. Uh, so you can see here the, the differentiation between uh, AV7706, 8805 and AV10, all are using HDM modules, but in different configuration and a different uh, mate actually. Yeah? So uh, AV7706, 8805, two layer PCB on the AV10, it's four layers. Uh, we have 15.4 channel processing, 95 blocks in total, a lot of components, uh, which is not about uh, uh, the sound signal passing through these components, but these additional components, which you can see, are often used to get a cleaner power supply for the HDAM. Yeah, so we always focus on getting the signal pass as uh, clean as possible, as less components in the way, but we always focus on as well to get the power supply and the current we are going to deliver to these HDAM modules very clean, yeah, because this is a source of noise which we want to avoid. Here we come now to the PCB, which I mentioned, four layers. Let's now hear the uh, um, uh, preamplifier PCB where all the boards uh, will get connected to. You can see on the right hand side, uh, we have two layers where actually all the signal uh, needs to run on. So you have a signal, you have power and you have ground. And um, this uh, on the right hand side, the AV8805, it's just, uh, let's say, organized on two, uh, two layers. While on the four layer PCB, we have the possibility to actually have an analog uh, uh, layer, then we have a ground layer to separate everything uh, better to the supply layer where we get uh, the power supply uh, lines on the power tracks. And then we have another ground layer. We will also have then this uh, control signal. So by that we can have a better separation between all the different um, signal areas, which gives us again a cleaner um, result. That's the inside. Uh, you have to imagine uh, I, I took off the front panel actually, and uh, you look from the front into the product. It starts with the power supply uh, on, on the front. Uh, then you get all the HDM uh, signals and the red rectangle, that's all analog. And then on the back, you will have uh, the, um, the digital connectivity and the, yeah, for, for the DSP, DA converters, and of course, HDMI and the uh, analog output port for the XLR and RCA. Yeah, so it's nicely separated again here, keep digital analog separated, keeps the audio signal as clean as possible, minimize interference. That's always what we're doing here. The power supply uh, for the analog section, again, is done with the toroidal transformer. So that has really uh, very low leakage, uh, but still can uh, cause some radiation. Um, but uh, we are keeping control on over it by putting the toroidal transformer into the aluminum case. And we're also adding an aluminum bottom plate to give it a solid foundation, so getting really clean. And if you look to the overall construction of the uh, AV10, it's a three-piece construction from, from the top lid, yeah, two aluminum, very heavy aluminum, 2.5 millimeter uh, thick uh, side covers, which are very heavy, a solid top lid. And then inside, you can see also um, that we have uh, a three-layer construction for, for the main chassis. So uh, the, the brownish one, which is actually copper-plated, uh, a layer on top, a layer underneath, nicely fixed together to get it really strong and solid um, because you don't want to have any vibration. The copper plating again is uh, for, for grounding, means uh, ground level needs to be as clean as possible because all the signals are running actually through the ground uh, and uh, by having a copper plate chassis, we can optimize the ground potential with very low impedance. Front panel as well, two and a half millimeter thick aluminium with a trapdoor. And behind the front panel, the white one you see, uh, is actually another shielding. It's a metal plate again, so that you don't get any interference from the uh, uh, microprocessor uh, located on the front panel to the audio signal uh, on, on, yeah, in the product itself. 
and it all stands on very nice feet. Uh, you see these are um, yeah very heavy uh, feet with a polycarbonate and uh, ABS, uh, ABS uh, compound uh, a solution, which is very solid. It uh, um, yeah, has a nice uh, structure and it gets the additional uh, felt, which also has quite some impact on the sound quality. Yeah? On the AV805, a different style, uh, style, a different type of material, and it got these, um, yeah, how do you call it, a hot stamp um, uh, aluminum foil ring for the Cosmic. But here now everything is black. Now we go into the measurements. Uh, so uh, that's uh, where some of you might just say, oh, what's that? Um, but uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, we will go more technical on this uh, webinar this time because uh, that's really how you can highlight what the reference product is about and uh, what our engineering team has achieved. What we see here is now THD plus N. So that actually means um, THD is the distortion. Um, you, you get uh, into a signal and plus N is the noise. And you can again compare here AV10 against the AV8805. And uh, if you just look to the uh, lower right figure, the dB figure, so on the AV8805, uh, it's about 29, uh, 92, 93 dB uh, signal to noise ratio plus N, um, THD plus N. So that's not uh, bad at all. However, on the AV10, we achieved 106 dB, which is really outstanding. And you can see that um, on these um, graphic, on the measurement graphic with the, these peaks, which are the test signal plus all the additional surrounding signals, that these are really getting much less on the AV10. And also the noise floor is going down. This is all this uh, little ripple here. <clears throat> so this is really an excellent result. And uh, if you look to the capability of driving a connected amplifier, it's always good to see uh, what is the, yeah, the output level you can achieve um, on, on this uh, unit. So the red line is the AV8805, and you can see that uh, on the AV10, first of all, it goes more to the right. Yeah? So AV8805 stops somewhere, let's say, um, what is it? Mm, uh, let's let's take the five volt line, uh, and then we have a distortion of 0 0.005, which is very low, while uh, the AV10 can actually do nine volt. So it's nearly double uh, with uh, having the same THD value. So that's a great achievement, and you can see as well. So on on the left hand side, you have the THD plus noise in, in percentage is really much lower against the AV8805 over the whole output level. So that's uh, really a nice figure. And here again, um, we are now coming to the dynamic range. Uh, again, an improvement of 4 dB, so 112 on the AV8805, 116 on the AV10. So 8805 dynamic range of 112 is already excellent. It's really fantastic. If you think about the CD, uh, a CD has a maximum resolution of 96 dB. So dynamic range of 112 is uh, excellent. Um, yeah, of 116, it's just uh, fantastic and outstanding. So really, really uh, um, a great achievement. And here again, uh, you see uh, the jitter. I mentioned about the DA conversion that uh, you have to keep uh, control of the clock signal uh, very carefully, uh, not to, to get any jitter. Jitter, actually, you can see if you have these peaks. So that you have the big peak in the middle, which is a test signal, and you have some peaks uh, uh, left and right beside it. This is a kind of uh, jitter issue, uh, where you had some on the AV805. AV10, it's clean as it can get. And again, you can see the, the red big line is actually the noise floor, we call it. And this is reduced by the AV10 quite significantly as well. So it's much lower noise. So you really get a very clean background uh, for 
yeah, actually, the cleaner your background is, the more you can get from your original audio signal. So that's a great achievement. On the technical side, everything is done perfectly. However, it doesn't mean that the product already is sounding good, because uh, to make it sounding good, we need this guy over here. That's our uh, sound master, Yoshinori Ogata, or also called Ogata-san. And uh, it's no magic in sound tuning, yeah? It's just hard work. So if engineering team did all well to prepare, let's say, the the base conditions, like I showed you, we have all these excellent, excellent measurement results. So it's all there. He can start to really work on the product to give it the right sound characteristic. And that's just done by, by knowledge, experience, and try and error. It takes a lot of time to find the right components, to play nicely together, to have a large sound stage, you know, to get a high level of clearness. So getting all the details nicely presented and having these also nicely focused. And uh, if you want to go deep into the uh, base area, it needs to be clean and precise as well. It needs to be fast and tight. That's where we're always aiming for. And uh, on top of it, uh, we of course still want to have our Maran's musical ma uh, luxury, so our musicality into uh, the overall presentation and really lets the customer enjoy what he get, what he is hearing. So he shouldn't care about all the techniques we do. For him, it's just important to listen and enjoy and to get some more sound. Great, so that was the AV10. And uh, of course, the AV10 needs a good partner and that's the M10. And uh, yeah, this is a nice iconic uh, display and I'm just asking Roland now to switch over the camera and show it to us here because this display the VU meter is, uh, yeah, I connected it here. So you see it's nicely uh, giving this uh, product a nice dynamic, uh, something is going on, uh, there's uh, very nicely uh, done and uh, implemented in here. What it does, uh, the display detects the, uh, the signal of channel number one of the amplifier and takes it from there to indicate the uh, actually the output power. Okay, then uh, let's jump into the the AMP presentation here. Also here we have a long history on uh, uh, AV power amplifiers. It all started with the MM8003, also in 2008 because I was a partner of the AV8803 and uh, yeah, you see the lineup we have right now. Uh, four amplifiers, two, five, seven and 16 channels, which will all uh, continue the, the current ones, but uh, the M10 will be on top of it. M10, uh, as well as the M AV10, of course, are made in Japan in our own factory. I didn't mention that before, but then, of course, uh, these type of products you only can make uh, in our own full controlled factory. The display, uh, the VU meter, I already uh, mentioned here, uh, the porthole. It's a traditional element of, uh, of Moran's. Uh, you see it on the left-hand side, the Model 9, uh, where it was used to adjust the bias of the tubes. Uh, slightly, um, <clears throat> let's say, um, getting some inspiration from the uh, watch industry, having a nice watch. So we put it all together to come up with the, uh, our new uh, display. And also what you can see here, it's made in Japan. So that's where we, again, highlight a bit of the Japanese roots. Yeah, back panel, a lot of connectors, uh, 16 channels in total. Uh, I will come to the details on the following slides. The real value, however, it's not the back panel, but it's actually what is inside. And uh, what we do have inside is a class D amplification. And we do have a 200 watt per channel uh, on eight ohms for 16 channels and uh, it will have 400 watt on four ohms so that indicates how stable and linear uh, the power amplifier works we have our hdm technology of course to drive the the power amplifier stages uh, pretty well and we have multiple functionality like biamp mode btl uh, uh, mode and uh, also smart remote management 
construction, uh, you see some similarity to uh, the AV10 as well. Um, let me highlight here uh, that we have, yeah, let's say, the different sections um, with the different sheeting. There's an additional sheeting uh, which you can see in the center, which wasn't there in the AV10. Uh, AV10, yeah but it's here to uh, build in to separate the power supply from actually the power amplifier uh, section, which is easier to, to get here. So um, let's start uh, a left lower corner um, and then turn clockwise. Left lower corner behind the front display actually, uh, underneath directly mounted to the uh, main chassis, we have the SMPS, the switching mode power supply, which is actually uh, delivering the energy for uh, all the power amplifier stages. Uh, on top of, uh, and then we have, um, um, yeah, going clockwise, you see the arrow. On the back, you see the um, eight stereo modules, uh, which do hold uh, the power amplifier and uh, also the input uh, section of uh, the AV uh, M10. Then we have the analog inputs for RCA and XLR input. And uh, then you see actually directly behind the front uh, plate on the top layer, we do have the uh, toroidal transformer and the analog power supply feed, featuring, uh, uh, feeding the analog input uh, of the AMP10. And uh, here it's uh, displayed again on the left-hand side, that's actually um, the, the power module including input board and speaker connectors, and you see the extra shielding we have. So there's one shielding um, beside uh, all the module, uh, power amplifier modules to, to minimize uh, crosstalk, to minimize interference. The shielding, uh, which you can see in the center uh, picture I already mentioned, just to separate the power supply and the uh, power amplifier sections. Uh, on front of, the, uh, you can also see now the switching mode power supply on the right-hand side. That's the um, toroidal transformer for the analog section. On, uh, and um, on picture number three, the one on the right, you can see there's another shielding box for the power inlet. Yeah, so it's all about getting a clean environment. And again, the chassis itself is copper plated to have the best grounding. Looking to the back and uh, the, the options we have to um, yeah, do the settings. Uh, the right picture, you can see uh, the top switch is showing RCA and XLR. Yeah, you can select which input you actually would like to have. Uh, the switch underneath uh, has the three positions with normal mode, yeah, just standard. Uh, then you have the BM mode where um, the, the same signal will be used uh, for, for both uh, uh, outputs. So that's, uh, I have another uh, slide for that one. And then you have the, the BTL mode where you actually bridge uh, two amplifiers to get more power. If you pay some little attention here, you'll see the channel one underneath the, uh, uh, the XLR input mentioned. And beside that one, you have the little VU meter uh, uh, icon that just to indicate this input is actually used to display or uh, to drive the VU meter. If you're operating the unit in BTL mode to double the power, then of course you only have eight channels of amplification. And then you use channel one, three, five, seven, up to 15. Um, the AV10 of course is capable of driving, yeah, two uh, M10 uh, simultaneously so that uh, in the end you can, up, can come up with the solution of one AV10 two M10s uh, having uh, 16 channels in BTL mode means having 16 channels with 400 watt on 8 ohm. So really uh, a tremendous power for the really demanding systems. Here you can see the different conf uh, configuration. Normal mode, of course, left, right. You go in with the left, right. In the center, you have the bi -amp mode. You're using the left input and then you get the same signal from uh, the yeah, channel one and channel two output to drive uh, mid-range, high frequency, and the bass uh, independently. And you have the BTL mode, where you also use, again, the left input terminal, and then you get uh, yeah, the double the power. So you're getting out 400 watt. 
that's a module in total uh, amplifier module which now holds the amplifier section which is more the one on the left hand side on the right hand side uh, um, the top uh, two boards are the inputs for RCA and XLR uh, then you have the uh, vertical one which is the um, uh, connection board itself and on the right hand side the lower part you can see the speaker terminals that's uh, actually uh, how the construction is uh, as I mentioned you have a RCA XLR input then you get the HDEM modules our uh, SA2 version in this uh, uh, case which are uh, here to actually um, let's say um, get out of the RCA signal so which is single-ended to get the um, balance signal like you have it on the XLR then uh, we have in the center the signal selector means which input do I use RCA or XLR input and then uh, after the uh, signal selector you have again HDM modules to drive actually the power amplifier module so HDM, uh, HDM you know we have in total 160 HDMs in this unit uh, 10 per per channel and um, that's how they are divided um, over the boards. Left hand side, uh, top, uh, you have the RCA input with four HDMs. Right, uh, then the lower picture, you have uh, the XLR input, the connection board, where you also find the uh, uh, sickness selector uh, IC built on, and then it will be passed on to the power amplifier. And the power amplifier itself looks like this. It's uh, designed uh, by Marantz. Um, it's nothing off the shelf. As you know, uh, you wouldn't expect uh, us uh, to have something off the shelf for a new reference flagship. So uh, we used uh, or designed our own based on um, IC power. And uh, if you look to the left, uh, you have the connector, the four connectors, which are actually the connectors for the speaker terminals. And if you look to the right, you have three connectors, which are also uh, these golden color, these shiny golden ones. These are the connectors for the power supply. You have plus, you have minus, and you have ground connector. And these will get uh, um, connected by a bus bar, which I'm coming on uh, later on. If you look to the components, these are all, uh, let's say, custom-made and hand-picked components to really get the best performance. And uh, yeah, it's uh, just working very stable uh, as said you have 200 watts on 8 ohm 400 watts on 4 ohm if you drive it in btl mode you even get 400 watts on 8 ohm so that's very solid just to indicate uh, quickly the signal parse here on the module on the top you have the rca input it goes directly to to the left to the power amplifier uh, section where you have um, the, 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 the switching transistors uh, to, to amplify the signal or to get the high current and it will just directly send out again to speaker terminals. So very short signal parse. The signal itself never uh, leaves the board itself. So it's not going uh, wire, wire, wire through the whole product. It just stays on the amplifier module board. So that's um, also done to keep the signal as clean as possible to get no interference. I mentioned the power supply uh, connectors. Uh, you can see here again, uh, as said, you have plus, minus, and the ground uh, potential. And all the modules are connected via very thick, uh, strong metal uh, bus bars, which do have a very low impedance, which gives us, in addition, uh, yeah, the, the benefit that you don't have wires and no no copper cables uh, which you have with uh, some connectors and another connector no you can really have now the bus bar very solid uh, fixed by a screw directly to the uh, terminals of the power amplifier module is very solid mate and uh, guarantees you that even on the highest uh, performance conditions highest highest demands highest currents there's no limitation you always will have a solid uh, rock solid uh, supply of uh, current and power. In total, there are eight modules. Yeah, as mentioned, they are stereo modules, and uh, all are completely identical. 
and they are connected by this bus bar, so it's it's very clean, uh, very symmetrically built up. <clears throat> power, of course, uh, needs to come from somewhere, and that's here the power supply, the SMPS, uh, which we are utilizing to drive all the uh, 16 channels, all the modules, uh, the stereo modules, the eight, uh, to get them the, the, the current, the power they need. However, again here, we keep uh, high control of the, the quality of the, uh, the, the supply uh, to have a very low noise on it. So we don't want to have any uh, interference from the switching power mode supply into the audio domain. Yeah, we just want to have the clean power. Again, here are some more components. That's now uh, the supply, the power supply for the analog section. I showed you that we had uh, the RCA input, XLR input with the HDEMS and then uh, the uh, input selector coming and then another stage of HDEMS. Uh, these are all feeded by uh, an analog power supply. Again, same like with the AV10, toroidal transformers. Uh, custom-made uh, custom uh, main capacitors, uh, especially done for audio. And on the power amp module itself, there's an hour um, uh, yeah, filter stage cleaning the, the supplied voltage uh, for each individual uh, stereo module, power module. So that's what you can see on the right-hand side with the right uh, uh, rectangle on it. Uh, so also here, like on the digital domain, you want to have really clean power um, for the amplifier. Again, here a summary of all the components, a high quality um, construction, of course. Connectivity, um, we talked about all the different switch uh, options we have. And you might wonder what, uh, yeah, of course you can uh, identify the speaker terminal very easily, which actually do derive from our HiFi products. So they are the same like used on model 40N, so really high quality. And um, the thing on the right-hand side, which Maren's printing on, you might wonder what this one is. Actually, because the terminals, the speaker terminals are quite big, right, quite solid, uh, the space actually uh, to put a bare wire in and to screw it or fix it in the terminal it's quite limited. Hence, we said we, we need to have a tool to properly uh, turn the speaker terminals. And that's the wrench you can see on the right-hand side, which comes with the products. Then you can easily uh, uh, fix the cables. And after that, uh, this unit or this wrench can be just attached to the unit, to the amplifier by a magnet, because uh, on the one side is a magnet, you just put it on so you don't lose it. Going into the measurement details, again, uh, a fantastic result. Uh, I'm doing the comparison here to the MM87.7, uh, the seven channel amplifier, which is class AB, uh, and uh, the M10 as mentioned is class D. What you can see is, uh, this now is a test uh, with uh, running the amplifier, outputting five uh, watt actually on, on a channel, uh, and same condition for both. And you can see that the uh, THD uh, plus N, yeah, distortion plus noise on the MM877 is uh, 85, 86 dB, which is okay, nothing to worry about. But on the M10, we improved by 10 dB, which is actually a world in, in hi fi. And uh, you can also see if you compare the he has a signal uh, with, with the peaks that uh, the overall noise floor is much lower. Yeah, because the, the M10 signal, measured signal, it's lower in the position, uh, like in comparison to what the 87.7 shows. So it's really bringing down the noise floor and also all these little additional peaks, which you can see left and right beside the, uh, uh, um, yeah, uh, the, the signal uh, peak are much less or even completely gone. So it's very clean uh, uh, amplification. And if you look here uh, also to the output power, 
so let's say the distortion over output power, you can first of all see that uh, up to there yeah, uh, what is it 20 dB, where the blue and the red line crosses, actually the THD of the AV10 uh, of the M10 is much lower. Uh, then the lines crosses on a very low level, so that's all fine, nothing uh, to worry about. But what you then can see is that the red line actually jumps at um, yeah uh, an output power of roughly 140 watt. It goes uh, uh, straight up because there is where distortion starts to kick in. So that's your limit. That's uh, where you actually specify the the wattage of the uh, of a product. You can see that the M10 goes further and actually can reach uh, a wattage of 200 watt. So that's uh, where yeah, these measurement results or the, these figures are coming from. So that's very solid, 200 watt and 8 ohm. And uh, yeah, if you go to the extreme and say I'm not having an 8 ohm load, but I'm going for a 4 ohm load, you can see that the M10 actually can achieve 435 watt of power, where in comparison the 87 was uh, 238 watt. So tremendous amount of power, tremendous uh, amount of control over the connected load, over the speaker. So that's fantastic. And also here, um, that's now the uh, signal to noise ratio, means actually uh, how low is my noise level. Yeah, so on the 877, 160B, Wow, was really quiet. On the M10, we are down to 118 dB. So that's so quiet, uh, that really gives you the best potential for a high quality audio reproduction because you just get the nice audio. No noise at all, it's so quiet. It's, I always compare to, to a dark night, so it's getting darker and darker and really it's big black where you get the audio signal nicely presented without any distortion. Here a nice comparison as well. So you know for Marantz we have the 70% guarantee on our um, amplifier, so means actually the stereo power we have. We guarantee that at least 70% are still available if you drive five channels simultaneously. Yeah, if I go for the um, 877 on the right hand side. Uh, I have 170 watts roughly in, in stereo mode, 70% of it is uh, it's 120. And you can see on the right hand side, if I drive five channels, uh, I still have 132 watt. So means 70% guarantee check. On the M10, it's different. We guarantee 100% of the stereo power, even if you drive five channels simultaneously. So that's really uh, underlines how stable uh, the power supply is, how, how nicely constructed the M10 is. So you have tremendous power, very stable, even under the, uh, the extreme conditions, you can just trust the product to deliver the performance your speakers will require. So let's sum it up. Um, AV10, M10, it's our reference set. It's um, yeah, where we said, tell us, show us what you can do engineering team. You are so experienced, you have some knowledge, uh, don't mind the cost, go uh, all in and give us the best product you can get, you can think of and bring it to the extremes integrate the latest technologies. And that's what they have done actually with the AV10 and M10. We have the 15.4 channel processing with the Griffin Lite XP processor, which I mentioned. We have the HDMI uh, 2.1 uh, um, certification with all 8K features, it's all there. We have the room acoustic uh, corrections, not only one, the Odyssey Mighty EQ XC32, which is of course free of charge and will stay in the product itself, of course. But also we are going to offer the Dirac Live uh, upgradability in beginning of uh, March, I would say. It should be available. And we have our Hero streaming technology, which also gives us not only the music streaming capabilities, but also the control capabilities by third-party uh, solutions via IP. 
Then we said, okay, best audio performance. I showed you all the different uh, things we have done from the power supply, the grounding, the four layer PCB, the HDAMs, and the customized components, our customized class D amplifier module, the bus bars. So all the stuff we have done to really get to the best of the best, to really have a new reference set to really get the state of the art product. And state of the art product also delivers state of the art laboratory figures. So I showed you several measurement uh, um, uh, results. We have tremendous power. We have really clean um, uh, noise floor, yeah, or very low noise floor, I have to say, a very clean background. Uh, so nearly 120 uh, dB uh, signal to noise ratio. It's just fantastic. Uh, we have the tremendous output power. We have the uh, THD plus N, which improved uh, quite significantly as well. So that's all underlies, uh, underlines uh, what our engineering team has done and achieved. And then uh, on top of that, of course, we still want the product to be uh, operatable yeah, by normal consumers. So we integrated the new uh, HD uh, user interface, the new uh, graphic user interface, which I showed you in the other presentation. We have some nice setup uh, assistance. We have the web GUI. We have uh, the um, the nice uh, remote handset with uh, with a backlit and uh, yeah, as said, this remote handset has an aluminium top, is nice and heavy and feels just luxury in your hands. And then of course, uh, this unit, this solution, I would say, I would like to call it, will go into uh, CI projects for sure as well in many times. And we have all the utilities you need to have on board to make the CI dealer happy. Yeah? So, uh, as said, we have the web user interface, we have the advanced CI mode, we have third-party control, we have uh, the smart remote management, which actually is uh, that you can look from the outside using, uh, for example, Domos or Oversee. Uh, you can uh, look from the outside into the product to, uh, to check conditions, to do a reset, uh, check temperature, whatsoever. Uh, you name it, yeah. And um, on top of it, you also have the free off-charge HMI diagnostic module or a solution built in. It's not a module, it's a, a, a technical a firmware a software solution, which is built into our product to really check your HMI chain and identify where problems uh, could uh, come from. If it's your cable, if it's your connected source, it is a certain setting. So it's all there to, to make our CI dealers happy as well. So, and uh, yeah, overall it's sound for what you see. So that's a claim we're already using for our cinema series, but of course it counts as well for the AV separates. And uh, it's just the best solution, the new separate reference set, the reference standard we want to set here with AV10 and M10. So Roland, you can switch. Thank so you very much, there. Oliver. That was a very nice technical walkthrough. Um, you guys may not have noticed that, but if you're on an iOS device, an iPad or a iPhone, you can see in the right bottom corner an indicator with likes, with uh, little hearts. And towards the end, it will be Zerk. So we got over 220 likes. So it goes to show we have a real winner here. We have a very nice product. And yes, we have a couple of questions. We have a little bit, a few minutes left, five maybe, a little 10 if we can stretch it. We talked about the stability in terms of low impedance. So you said five channels can be driven uh, at four ohms without any problem. What about uh, stability at two ohms? Vamshi is asking at least like stable at 25 watts per channel on two ohms or without jumping into production mode? It's a particular technical question. Yeah, I don't know. That goes really deep now. Uh, we will have to do some measurements, but uh, don't worry about a 2 ohm load. Uh, I don't know if I can give you 25 watt. I think it will be much more than just 25 before uh, protection will kick in. Uh, no worry. It can go 2 ohms uh, without any problem. The limitation in the end will be uh, the current the uh, power supply can deliver. That's correct, yeah. Um, we're also talking about BTL mode. So how flexible is that in terms, it, it works in pairs, so you've got eight pairs. Can you do like uh, specific channels in BTL and the rest in, in, in plain mono? Right, yeah. 
So as said, these are all stereo modules. So we have eight stereo modules and every single stereo module you can uh, use as you like. You can do use it as a normal, you can use it as a BM or you can use it as a BTL. Important to know is if you make any changes on the settings on the rear, on these little uh, switches, you have to do a power cycle on the amplifier. So only on the power cycle, uh, the unit will identify what is the setting on the rear channels, uh, on the on the rear switches, just to protect the unit uh, be, uh, for for any damage or your speaker for any damage when you do switching uh, during operation. That's a good point. If you're using by amp, then in this case, where do you set the crossovers? The crossovers. You you're not going to set any crossovers. The crossovers is actually set in the speaker itself because you have uh, yeah, a terminal to connect, to connect your bass and you have a terminal to connect your mid and high frequencies. So the crossover is actually done in the crossover of the speaker. That's right. So it's passive. It's not active crossover. Exactly. Excellent. Yeah. In the Hi-Fi products, we're using Hypex modules for class T. Is that the same in the AMP uh, 10 or is this a different technology used? No, it's a different technology. So the, the HyPEX modules itself, like used in M10 or uh, Model 30, they are much bigger size-wise. They will not fit into an M10 if you want to have uh, the 60 channels. So it's a different solution we are using here. But as mentioned, it's a customized. That's something we developed with a partner. Okay, so next question about HDEMs. So the HDEM SA2 for the AMP10 and HD, HDEM SA3 for the AV10, is there a particular reason for that? As said in, in other presentations, um, I'm, I'm happy to repeat it. SA2, SA3 doesn't mean that uh, one is better than the other. It's just uh, the different application uh, in the circuitry where we use the SA2 or SA3 module. They, they do have different, uh, let's say, tasks. Uh, what they do uh, with the signal, if you need uh, just a buffer stage or if, if you do need a driver stage, so that's uh, or a filter stage, that's where we use HMSA2 or SA3. So it's not about the different uh, quality, but it's more about the different application in the product itself. Okay, so what kind of speakers have you particularly used with the AV10? Yeah, so uh, of course we do like our Bauer speakers. Uh, driving a, a set of 700 is uh, a, a nice solution. Uh, if you would like to go extreme, you can also take an eight, 800 series. Or our um, thinking about a custom installation, of course all our CI speakers, in-wall speakers. These are happy partners for our M10. Yeah, for what it's worth, we just came back from a summit in Dubai and we had the AV10 M10 combo driving the reserve series from Paul Codio. And that was very, very impressive with four subwoofers, directional sub. So that was very, very nice. Um, somebody's commenting that this is so far the best presentation by Marantz. This kind of technical stuff that dealers like me uh, look for depends on third party measurements and such. So now we can confidently push all the Marantz uh, amp. Uh, amplifiers so that's a good mm -hmm. thing um i'm Great, looking through the list to see if there's any more coming in yes there's a question from korea is there a dedicated on off switch for turning on off the backlit remote of the remote control yeah on on the uh, side of the remote there's a little switch a little button you can press and then the light goes on for about five seconds yeah if you press and hold it will stay just on Okay, well, we're right on time. I'm not seeing any new questions coming in. So there you go. Perfect uh, presentation. A uh, lot of, actually, no, we still have questions coming in. All right, okay. so one more time. So how long can the M10 be used utilizing all 16 channels? How long? How long? As long as you like. Uh, five movies, 10 movies. No, um, I don't know what, what you're pointing to, or maybe it's, um, heating up or I, I don't know 
No, it's uh, there's no limitation. You can run uh, all channels uh, in parallel, and you yeah enjoy it. But it goes beyond saying that, of course, you need proper cooling. You're not going to put it in the rack. You need the heat to be able to go somewhere so that it doesn't overheat, yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Question from Australia. Can you please recap the CI-related features and the thought process of what CI dealers will enjoy with the AV separates? Mm -hmm. So the AV separates, um, let's say, for a CI dealer, um, reliability is very important. That's a given on these products, of course. Uh, control via third parties, you know, be it uh, control for uh, AMX system, Crestron, whatsoever. It's uh, uh, all possible. We have different, uh, let's say, control ports for it. It can be IP controlled uh, via the, the HEOS network solution. It can be R232 or uh, Flasher or Trigger um, outputs and inputs. Um, we have for setting up uh, the web user interface. So it's uh, you can do a manual setup very easily using your computer, just typing in the IP address in a web browser, and uh, you have access to the setup GUI. The setup GUI will also give you the access to an advanced mode, where you can, uh, uh, let's say, activate and deactivate uh, all kinds of features like uh, Spotify, Bluetooth, uh, remote app use. You can uh, lock the uh, firmware update, you can lock the display, you can lock uh, the setup so that the customer is not able to uh, fiddle around with it and uh, screw up your system. So with these kind of features we have, uh, we have the HDMI diagnostic uh, solution where you can check uh, your HDMI uh, chain, means from, from source to cable, to AV, to cable, to, to the display. Uh, you can see uh, if the uh, signal flow is proper, if there's any issue, where might be the limitation, so you can identify actually problems uh, in, a, in a setup uh, with that tool. And uh, you have the uh, smart remote management. Smart remote management means uh, the CI dealer actually installs a, a solution like, uh, as mentioned, Oversee. Uh, or Domos at the customer's house, and via this uh, solution, he can access uh, the AV10 and even the M10. So the M10 doesn't have network uh, control. The AV10 can read out data information from the M10 and feed it back to the smart remote management system. That means the CI dealer doesn't need to go to customer's home, but just be in shop and check the system if everything is running smooth or where an issue might occur. So this we kept in mind uh, for, for the dealers, uh, CI dealers in specific, yeah. And getting the IP is also very easy. You don't need to go through the setup. There is a particular trick for it. Yeah, correct. Uh, we have the status button on the front of the unit. And if you press it for five seconds, it will uh, show you the, the IP address in the display and you can target through it and also get MAC address and so on. Let me double check. Any chance to get more solid interface for Amazon HD? I think that's on the roadmap, some additional functionality in the Kiosk app. Is that correct? Yes, already on the roadmap and some is already released. So like uh, uh, support of playlists and so on, that's uh, added already. So we already extended the capability of Amazon support. Okay, that's it. Yeah. Thank you very cool. much for joining us. Um, uh, yes, we're just about 42, so that's uh, a little bit over time, but very happy to go through all the answers and uh, very happy for you guys to join us. So keep following us, subscribe to the YouTube channel. We'll have more of these webinars next year. I believe this is the last one that we have for this year. Is that right, Oliver? That's correct, yes, yeah, Frederick. That's the last one for this year. Thank you very much for, for joining. Uh, continuously our sessions here. I'm pretty happy that you like the stuff and uh, I will continue to prepare it and uh, yeah, if you continue to sign in, I'm, I'm very happy. Thank you very much, Frederick. Thank you, Roland, for, for your support here and uh, have a nice day.